This video will talk about the importance of confidence intervals and the analysis of variance in regression. So we can calculate confidence intervals for both beta 0 hat and beta 1 hat. And here's the formula if you wanted to do this out by hand. So we could set our level of alpha, and that would rely on what our confidence interval and what we want that to be. And then we need some value of t from the t-table. And then we need to know what the residual mean square is. And we need to know what s sub xx is. But if we've already calculated the slope and we've calculated the intercept, we probably already have these values. And so we could calculate a confidence interval uh, around the values for beta 1 hat and for beta 0 hat. So if we have a p-value very close to 0, we would reject the null hypothesis that, say, beta 1 equals 0, and we would conclude that there's a significant linear relationship between the dependent and independent variable. And if we looked at the values within that confidence interval, if we ended up rejecting the null hypothesis, the value 0 should not be contained within the confidence interval. And so that's an important attribute and why you might look at the confidence interval to say something about whether or not beta 0 hat and beta 1 hat are any good. You could also think about using what we call an analysis of variance approach in regression. This goes back to the fact that we can partition the variability of the regression and the residuals that result from that regression. In this case, we could set a null and alternative hypothesis as this. Our null could be that mu1 equals mu2 equals mu n. Our alternative might be that some mu sub i does not equal some mu sub j that's in our data. And so then we could say that the ANOVA hypothesis will only be true if beta 1 equals 0. That is, if beta 1 is 0, the slope is 0, that would mean the regression line is flat. So that would mean as x changes, nothing happens to y. So what might that look like if we were to plot that? Well, in this case, our null hypothesis is depicted on the left. The null hypothesis is that beta 1 equals 0, that there is a straight line. The alternative hypothesis says that beta 1 is not 0. In this case, it's probably greater than 0 because we're seeing a positive line here. And so a visual interpretation of that is here. If there's no relationship between x and y, we would expect to see what we see here on the left. If there's a positive relationship, we would expect to see what we see here on the right. Now we can partition that data using this ANOVA table. And so here uh, we have a certain number of degrees of freedom for the regression, for the residual, and for the total. And we represent each uh, row in the ANOVA table with the sums of squares. So again, remember we have the sums of squares for the regression, the sums of squares for the residual, and then the total sums of squares. We also have the mean square for the regression, the mean square for the residual. We don't have a mean square for the total uh, just because we partition that out into the regression and the residual uh, mean square values. Our value f will come into play when we do an f test or a test of the regression. And that would equal the last two cells divided by one another. The mean square for the regression divided by the mean square for the residual. And so this is how we could write out, for example, with the chicken and lysine data, what the data look like. And here it is for the, for the chicken and lysine data. We have one degree of freedom for the regression, 10 degrees of freedom for the residual, giving us a total of 11 degrees of freedom. Remember, we had 12 observations in the data set. We can calculate the sums of squares. We can calculate the mean squares. And then we have a value for f. Our value for f equals 26.52. The alpha thing you can do is you can also examine whether or not beta 1 is 0. This is kind of redundant in simple linear regression. We already calculated 
a confidence interval for beta 1 hat, and we know that high p-values will indicate the model is not significant. And so the F statistic is identical to the square of the T statistic for the slope for that beta 1 hat variable whenever there's one degree of freedom. So as an example, if you look at the chicken data, we calculated the value for F in the ANOVA table as 26.52. If we looked in the R output when we did this, we got 5.15. And if we square that, that's equal to t squared, which is equal to 26.52. And so this is why whether or not you do an F test for the regression or a t test for the slope, you're going to get the same answer in terms of the significance of that regression line. Here's a visual way to interpret what we're looking at. What happens when the sums of squares for regression is small? and the residual sums of squares is small. What you get here is a very short or a non-steep slope, but all of the points are very close to that regression line. What happens if you have all the points very close to the regression line, but now you have a steep slope? Well, that would indicate a large sums of squares for the regression. That would mean your regression line does a pretty good job. All those data points are close to it, and it's steep. What about the opposite? That is when you have a lot of residual sums of squares, very large values, but small regression sums of squares. That could indicate a very mild slope to the line with a lot of scatter around your data. And so you can see how the data are so much more scattered here than for the values when there's a small residual sums of squares. Same thing when sums of squares for regression is large and the residual sums of squares are large, you get a steep slope, but there's still a lot of variability around the regression line. And so here's just a few examples of things that you might notice when you plot the data points along with your regression line.